one of the most uh, overused words in our society is the word awesome. But that really is awesome when uh, you see public, people publicly profess their faith in Christ. I think that's the, the best time in the life of the church. Um, glad you're here. I know some of you are part of the International Fellowship Core Group, and some of you are here for the baptism, and you may not have known what you were getting into after that. Uh, so hopefully this won't be too painful for you. Um, it's not really a sermon. Uh, Pastor Philip asked us if we would come and do some training in small groups, um, about small groups, for small group leaders, for international fellowship. And, uh, you know, if you weren't coming prepared for something like that, if you can't stay for the whole time, don't feel bad about slipping out or anything like that. I'm not going to throw anything at you, make fun of you, or anything like that, okay? Really make fun of you once you stick around a little bit, and then, then, then we pick on you. It's okay to smile or laugh or... Um, let me introduce us real quick. Um, my name is Jimmy Inman, and I'm one of the elders and uh, the teaching pastor here at True Life. That's uh, one of the sponsored churches for International Fellowship. And this is Rusty Arwood, and Rusty is also one of our elders. And he's our small groups pastor uh, here at True Life. And uh, Rusty and I have been friends since we were 11 years old. And uh, you know, a lot of you guys are uh, young. Rusty and I are 44 now. We can't believe it, but. Uh, you know, you probably experienced it. You had some friends in high school that you thought would be friends for the rest of your life, and you, they've kind of already gone by the wayside. And you'll experience that when you get out of college, too. So when you have true lifelong friends that you can really share life with, that, that's a really special thing. That's a blessing from God. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that you, you, that you realize that going forward. So I appreciate Rusty. We actually got to uh, do this training in Honduras, um, I guess, a little over a, a year ago. And so now to get to do it with another cultural context as well is really cool for us. Um, how many of you got something like this when you came in? If you, if you didn't, I um, want to make sure you get one. Anybody, if you need this, this is the notes for the evening. Yeah, if you if you'd hold your hand up, maybe Carl, you and uh, John care to hopefully you have enough. If not, uh, maybe you can share. Married couples, you can share, right? Maybe you can share with the person next to you. Maybe you get to like them or something. And Rusty and I are going to kind of tag team this and just kind of uh, go back and forth. Um, let, let, me, let me start with, with, with a question. Okay, when, when you hear the, the term small groups or some people call them cell groups, or I mean, there's different terminology that, that could be used. What, what, what do you think about? What, what comes to your mind when you hear that phrase? Okay, relational. What, what else? Okay, intimate. Okay, getting close to people. What, what else? Okay, group of people. Anything else? Okay, food. <laughs> That's one of the core values of the true life small groups, right, Carl? Anything else? How many of you are currently in or, or have participated in some type of small group before? Okay, so a lot of you. Um, was it a good experience? You ever had a bad experience in a small group? Okay. Well, our, our philosophy of ministry of True Life is that we are a church of small groups. And International Fellowship is really going to be the same way, maybe even more so, because I know the plan, at least early on, is not to have like a weekly worship service, but to have weekly small groups and a monthly uh, worship service. And so... That means that the small groups will be incredibly important with that type of ministry strategy. I know even at True Life, I mean, we have two Sunday morning services, but I mean, we don't have like a Sunday evening service. We don't have a, like a Wednesday night service other than once a month. We have a worship service, a prayer service, because we're really trying to put most of our eggs in the small group 
basket. Uh, we, most of the ministry of the church takes place through small groups, and it would be very similar for international fellowship. I tell people a lot of times in their membership class at True Life, and I really mean it, if for some reason, and, and hopefully it's not an either or thing, but if for some reason, be it schedule or whatever, you couldn't come to a Sunday morning service and be a part of a small group. You had to pick between one or the other. I would much rather, without any hesitation, you be plugged into a small group than you come and hear me preach on Sunday morning. I, I think that small groups are, are that important when they're done right. And, and, and we use this analogy to convey what we're talking about uh, with, with small groups of true life. And, and maybe this will kind of help you see a picture of it. Um, we, we use the idea of rows and circles. Rows and circles. Go back and take geometry again or something like that. Okay. You're, right now, you're sitting in rows. Right? And pretty much everybody, I would imagine, uh, like when you're in a setting like this, say when you're in a Sunday morning service, what do you normally see? I mean, some people see their eyelids, but uh, what, 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 what do most people see uh, in, in a service? You see kind of the back of somebody's head, right? It's not necessarily real relational, is it? There may be a greeting time during the course of the service, and you kind of shake people's hands, hi, how you doing, and what, everybody lies, right? Oh, I'm great, nice to see you. You know, you may have just killed your wife or your kids on the way to church, but, you know, we're awesome now, right, because we're in church and we want to act all spiritual. Uh, or you may talk to somebody a little bit before or afterwards, but you don't really build deep relationships in worship services. You make acquaintances. In small groups, though, you develop friendships. You build relationships. You have the opportunity to really share life with people. And so then in, in a small group, we use the analogy of, of a circle, and we could all try to get in one big circle right now. But, uh, you know, in, in circles, which is how, you know, small groups normally in a home, you're sitting around couches, chairs, or, or, or whatever. You're in a circle. You're face to face, right? You, you can talk. You can connect. And part of the idea of a small group is I don't know exactly how many people are in this room right now. I would guess there's probably 50, so, something like that, somewhere in, in, in that ballpark. It would be hard for us to have a small, intimate gathering, get in somebody's house, and really connect with this number of people. But if we divided this group up into four or five groups and kind of spread out around the room, got in a circle, started talking, started sharing about our lives, then at that point, we can begin to connect. That's the idea of a small group. It's, it's in circles. It, it, it's, it's in relationships. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with a worship service, right? We're, we're commanded as Christians... Uh, the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of, of yourselves together. Here, here's the point. Here's why we have church on Sunday morning and gather together to worship. Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday morning. Sunday is the first day of the week. So foundationally, here's the two things we're, we're doing by gathering to worship on Sunday morning, although it obviously doesn't have to be Sunday morning. It can be Sunday evening, Saturday night. It can be whenever. But, you know, generally it's Sunday morning. When we gather on Sunday to worship Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior, what we're doing is, is we are honoring Him. We are recognizing the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, His grace, His blood spilled for our sins. But we are saying that the first priority in our lives is to worship Jesus, and we're going to reflect that by making it a priority to be together with God's people, giving glory to our great God and King. The first fruits, the first act of our week is to do that. Does that make sense? Um, and and I, I hope that's a conviction that we have because, you know, sometimes we, we want to make a decision every week whether or not we're going to go to a church service or not. But if that's our conviction, if that's our understanding, there's really not much of a decision uh, to it. So even though we're in rows and maybe we're facing floor, we're, we're looking at a, at, a, at a worship team, at a band, at a screen, at, at a preacher, we are still together with God's people. We're worshiping Him together. We're um, giving Him glory. We're 
praising Him. We're praying. We're hearing God's Word taught in which the Holy Spirit speaks through the Word of God. God is working. There's something that's powerful about people getting together to sing and to praise and to worship. And there's something that's always powerful about the preaching uh, of the Word of God. There's just something special uh, about church service when people are in fellowship with God. And in that kind of context, the more the better. Right? It's more exciting the more people you have. There's just more life. There's more energy. Uh, everybody can sing louder and like the really bad singers like me get drowned out. And, 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 you know, and I can feel comfortable singing and like not think I'm hurting somebody's ears beside me or something like that. That I can make a joyful noise to the Lord. So the more the better. But if it's only a crowd on Sunday morning, people get lost in the crowd. People get lost in the road. But connection and life transformation, because life transformation usually takes place in the context of connection, happens in circles. It happens in small groups. And so Rick Warren says that every church ought to be growing larger and smaller at the same time. He's exactly right. He goes on to amplify that by saying this. He says every church ought to be growing larger through evangelism and reaching more people for Christ, which is true church growth. But at the same time, every church ought to be growing smaller because people are getting connected together in relationships in small groups. And that's biblical church growth. We see that in in the book of Acts. If if you would, look here in in your notes where you can turn in in, in your Bible. But these three scriptures that we're going to look at uh, to kick us off tonight are, are, uh, are all quoted here in this first paragraph. Acts 246. It says, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Here's what Acts 5.42 says. It says, daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ or as the Messiah. Acts chapter 20, verse 20, it says, Paul speaking said, that he kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Now, do you see a pattern in those three verses? What's the pattern there? What's kind of the, the, the repeated pattern that's going on there? You see that? Corporate worship in small groups. They, they gathered together in the temple courts and, and, you know, there were thousands and thousands of people. Remember how fast, if you know the book of Acts at all, the early church grew? I mean, within just a few chapters, they stopped numbering them and start, just started calling them a multitude. The last recorded number was 5,000 men. So we're talking, you know, tens of thousands of people. And I had the privilege of going to Jerusalem one time, and the Kippur courts are massive. I mean, they could have accommodated thousands of people, but then they were also meeting in homes, in small groups, rows, circles. And to us, that is a biblical pattern for how to do ministry. Now, let me just say one more thing, and I'm going to turn it over to Rusty. And, and we're kind of teaching this from the perspective of true life. And then as you go along, Philip will kind of adapt it more and more to what you're doing with international uh, fellowships. So we're just kind of using some material we use with our leaders at True Life. We kind of tweaked it a, a, a little bit. But just kind of one more thing, if I can say in, back, in, in, in the background, okay? When we talk about the church tonight, this is what we're talking about. There's two biblical aspects to the church. There's the universal church, which is all Christians everywhere. Heaven on earth, doesn't have anything to do with denomination or anything else like that. If you are a Christian, you are a child of God, you're part of the family of God, God's your father, you're his son uh, or, or, or daughter, and, and we together are brothers and sisters in Christ, we are one in Jesus Christ, and that is the church. But then, the primary way that the church is talked about in the New Testament is through a local church. And, you know, most of the letters in the New Testament were written to particular local churches or to a group of churches in, in a particular area or to a leader of a local church like Timothy or Titus. Uh, so 
the, the church is God's people. The uh, the universal universal church is all Christians, but you know, the, the, really, the way we truly are a part of the church and truly engage as the church is through a local body uh, of, of believers. And the, the church is God's redeemed that gather together to worship Him, that hear the Word of God preached, that, that practice baptism and communion and church discipline, that have biblical church leadership, that, that which we believe are a plurality of elders, but that, that are, it's designed to you know, carry out God's plan to build His kingdom in the world, that we're here to worship, we're here to evangelize, we're here to make disciples, to fellowship together, to love each other, to serve and, and, and be a blessing to the world, to be salt and light in the world, you know, to plant churches and just to, to multiply the kingdom of God until Jesus comes back. And you know what you saw with Jason being baptized, is how someone publicly professes their faith in Christ. And when you read the, the book of Acts, they were just living out what Jesus told them to do. And Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, uh, or 18 and 19, sorry, that, uh, you know, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And that's what they did in, in the book of Acts. And so a Christian, a follower of Christ, is someone who hears about Jesus, realizes that they're separated from God by their sin, uh, sees their need for their relationship with God, is broken over their sin, and repents of that sin, asks God to forgive them, places their faith and trust in Christ. And then when we do that, we become a part of the church, we publicly confess that through baptism, and then we're to grow as a disciple of Christ. But the way that we grow as a disciple is not as just as an individual, but it's in the context and it's in relationship with our family, the family of God, other believers. Right, Christianity was never designed to be an individual sport. It's a team sport. And Christianity was, is more like football or basketball or baseball than it is tennis or, or, or golf. It, 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 it's a team sport. It, it's not an individual thing. And, and it really does take all of us uh, working together, that, that we need each other, and I think if we're really going to connect and, and be there for each other and, and, and be a part of the body of Christ, that the best way for that to happen is in the context of small groups. Okay? So, Rusty, let's come and talk about some of our core values. Well, thank you all for um, being here tonight. And, Phil, thank you for inviting us. I am not a public speaker. I, I don't claim to be one. It, when Jimmy gets up here, he's really good at it. He got all the brains. I got all the looks. And we work well together. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Now, it, Jimmy and I, we really have been good friends for a long time, and it's a real blessing. Um, the reason I think that's so important is because somebody said this a minute ago, uh, when you think of small groups, what do you think about? Somebody said relational or relationship based. When we think about Christianity, let's start with this. It's real baseline. What is Christianity all about? Is it about a religion? Is it about a set of rules, laws, all those things? Or is it not about a relationship? That's what distinguishes Christianity from all the other religions is that personal relationship with Christ that He offers us that we can experience. So, if Christianity, if it's based upon relationships, then that means to me that God created us with the capacity to be relational, to be able to relate to other people. And when we don't experience that in our own lives, there's something that's not right. There's something that we are missing. And it's a blessing that God offers us to have those relationships. That's why I think true life is so serious about our small group ministries because we realize that as good as it is to be here on a Sunday morning and to worship together corporately, and it is good, it's a blessing, as good as that is, we realize that there's more. There needs to be more in our lives as Christians. We need to be able to relate to other believers in a different way. So, as we think about... Um, what our values are as, as far as small groups are. And you've got this information. I'm just going to go through these and just talk a little bit about them. But Jimmy 
mentioned the first one, uh, following the biblical pattern. Now, this is something that I, I've been in church my whole life. My dad is a pastor, and he took on a full-time pastorate when I was five years old. So I grew up in church. I know what it's all about. Uh, typical Southern Baptist church. Uh, and, and honestly, we never talked about small groups from the time that I was a kid until, basically, until I came to True Life Church. And, you know, there, I, I've noticed that churches now are, are catching on to the terminology more, it seems like. But yeah, I remember my dad even telling me that back in the, I guess, 60s, maybe early 70s, that when he was younger, that they would get together and meet in homes and have Bible studies together and all those things. But then... When I was, you know, when I was born and started going to church, we, we never even talked about that. That was never even something that we did. I, I, I guess I never really thought about it. But when we started developing our philosophy of small groups and we started realizing that Scripture teaches that the early church, they practiced this. You know, to me, that's a good, that's a good reason for us to continue on practicing that. So... It, the Bible teaches it. That's a, that's a great reason for us to experience that together. Is because that's God's word and it teaches us that. Secondly, um, people are our priority. Uh, now, you know, what does that mean? Well, we don't want to be a church that's all about programs. And what I mean by programs are we're just going to set up all these different things. We're going to have a, a class for this, a class for this, a class for this, a class for this, and hopefully. When you come, you'll fit into one of these classes or one of these programs. And not really focus on what the need is for the people. Uh, we we want to be very intentional about, you know, meeting people wherever they may be in life. And they may not need one of these typical programs. My guess is, for International Fellowship, it may look different than the traditional church in America. You know, it's, it's a whole different way of relating to people. So I would encourage you to think, if, if you are serious about being one of the uh, core group people and maybe even a small group leader, realize that, you know, this will really work for you because you're going to try to meet people where they are and not worry about setting up all these programs. Number three, uh, relating properly to one another. This obviously is important um, in everything that we do in life, but look on the, uh, the next page. The, the Bible has so many different commands for Christians to think about how can we relate to one another as believers. And there's a page full of these, but just look at a couple of them. In Mark it says that we are to have peace with one another. In John it says... Um, that we're to love one another. I've, I've loved you that you also love one another. Romans 12 says, Be kindly affection to one another with brotherly love. Romans 12 again says, Be of the same mind toward one another. Um, edify one another. Receive you one another. Admonish one another. Care for one another. See, the Bible is full of these commands of what we are to do for each other as Christians. And so... We believe that that is of utmost importance, that we relate properly to people. Now, you can have close relationships with people and really not base that relationship on anything that's godly. But we want to make sure that as believers that we are relating properly to other people and following what God teaches us in His Word and how we can relate to one another. Um, number four, experiencing life together. What does this mean? How do we experience life together? It's, is that, I mean, it sounds complicated, but it's really not. You know, all we're saying here is that, you know, we want to have true fellowship with one another. And that word has been overused in the church. Has it not? If you've grown up in church at all, we talk about fellowship all the time. Hey, we're going to have a fellowship 
at our church. And to the typical church-going person, having fellowship means what, Carl? You said it earlier. Food. That's what, that's what the typical church thinks about when we say we're going to have a, a, a church fellowship. That means bring your favorite dish to the church. Let's all meet together and let's have fellowship. We're going to eat together. That's part of fellowship. There's nothing wrong with that. That's all we, we talked about. They ate in different homes. That's a good thing. But if that's all fellowship's about, then we've missed something. It's more than that. It's about having that common life together, that that thing that we can relate to each other in and, and living life together in a way that we relate and understand each other in a way that maybe the world doesn't understand us. So we want our small group ministry to, you know, really uh, dive into living life together with each other, fellowshipping with each other, going to a different level than what you can do just having potluck dinner. All right, number five, um, authenticity or being authentic. Um, hopefully, if you're in a small group setting, it gives you the opportunity to be a little more of really who you are and not put on a, a, a church face and just come to a place where, you know, everything's great. Somebody said just a minute ago, you know, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm great. You know, we're really, there's a lot of things going on in your life. Maybe you're hurting. Uh, maybe you're worried about something. Maybe you're struggling in some way. And when you're in a church setting like this, it's really hard to kind of get into that kind of stuff. You know, how are you doing? Shake somebody's hand. Really what we're asking is, I really want to hear you say I'm doing great. Shake my hand, pat you on the back. I love you. Good to see you. And I'll talk to you later. But in small groups, we, we give you the opportunity. It gives you the opportunity to be more authentic and be real. And we've had a lot of experiences in, in our small group ministry where we have seen people that are really hurting, that are in desperate need of something. And we've been able to, you know, love on those people and, and really try to help them through hard times because they could be real there. They could talk about it, and, and we could pray for them and do different things that way. But hopefully it gives you a, an opportunity to be more uh, authentic and real about what's going on in your life. Number six is every believer is a minister. Do you know that if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Christ, that you are called to minister to other people? I mean, it's not Pastor Jimmy's responsibility to do everything in the church. It's not one of the other uh, elders here, or it's not just the small group leader's responsibility. Every person, every believer has been gifted from God. Perhaps you know what your gifts are, your spiritual gifts are, or maybe you don't. Maybe some of you have never uh, thought about that and, and experienced, um, you know, what that's all about. But, you know, God has, the Bible teaches that He has created us and He's gift, gifted each one of us in a different way. If that's the case, if that's true, which I believe it is, then that means that He has given you perhaps a way or an ability to connect with someone or to minister to someone in a way that I can't or that Pastor Jimmy can or that Pastor Philip can't. And God expects you to use that gift to minister. The Bible says there's many members, but there's one body. So we have to work together as a team. The last thing as we talk about our core values is multiplication. And this is this is really what it's all about. We want to see more and more and more people coming to Christ. Everything that we do in the church should be about reaching the lost people and finding ways to, you know, introduce people to Christ that have never heard of Him. Now, does that mean that we can't have discipleship? Well, absolutely not. We need discipleship. We need to learn. We need to grow. But 
why are we doing that? Why are we trying to learn this for a purpose? It's to glorify God and to reach other people for Him. So, in our small group ministry, you know, what we're trying to do is to develop leaders that can reach another group of people, and we're going to continue to grow to a certain point, and then we want to see our, our small groups actually birth into another small group. You see this over and over and over and over again. And if we do that, then we'll see God's kingdom expand. And we'll see more people come to Christ. Now, and that's, we just saw this baptism. That's just a picture. That's a, that's a picture of what God wants us to do. He wants someone to share God's love with someone else. And when we do that, we allow God to speak through us and, and we show people through our lives what God has done for us. You know, God's Holy Spirit then speaks to someone, draws them to Himself, and then we see that person surrender their hearts to Christ. That should happen over and over again. You know, my guess is, is that just as Jason, you know, gave his testimony tonight, you know, that speaks to all of us. If you're not a Christian, hopefully that spoke to you in a way that it spoke to me. But the point is, is that He's already beginning to share his faith. That was the first step. And we're going to see that over and over again. So hopefully, uh, uh, you know, as, as the International Fellowship Church continues to grow, you'll see multiplication in that over and over again. Okay, let me, um, let, let, let's do a visual example and kind of get you guys moving around for a second. Before we do that, anybody have any questions so far? We don't want this just to be us kind of dumping on you. Uh, any questions? Okay, well, I want to do an example, and I'm going to kind of show you what we're talking about so far. Uh, Dr. Phil, if you and Dr. Henson come up here for a minute. Okay, we Everybody's going to end up being involved with this, okay? But, but, but you guys are going to be the starting place, okay? All right. You guys have just been appointed the, the, the first two small group leaders of International Fellowship, okay? So your first task is to go and uh, get seven other people and just right now create a small group of eight people, okay? And then you can be in this corner. And Phil, if you can be in this corner over here, okay? So, the, and let's try to do it as quickly as we can. So, go grab seven other people. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good job. So now here's here's your second task as leaders. And once again, you got to do it quickly. And you know, it's just an illustration, so you know, don't get too hung up on it. But okay, you, you have to now uh, select your next leader, or your assistant leader, who will be your next small group leader that you're going to train and develop. Okay. So so do that real quickly. You got yours? Okay. Danny must be a better leader. He got his assistant leader first. He, he's faster. Okay. All right. So we got a small group, eight people. We got an assistant leader. Okay. So now here's the, the task number three. We got to grow the group now. So each group's got to go out now and get eight other people and bring them into your group. So go do that as quickly as you can.
Okay, so I, I, I got another question. I got a question for you now. We, we, we've taken three steps. We've, we've pointed a leader. We've created a group. We actually, we've actually taken four steps. We've pointed a leader. We've created a group. Uh, we have um, uh, determined a system leader. And now what was this fourth step that we just took? Wait, no, wait a second. Did we mul- have we multiplied? Okay, we've added right now. We, we, everybody got that? We, we've added, we, which is good, right? We, we've reached out, which is part of what small groups are supposed to do. We brought other people into the fellowship. So now here's a follow-up question. What's good about that? And, and what's, what's good about that? Okay, we grow. Well, well, but, 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 but why is that good? Well, Okay, touching more people, more people are connected, more insight, more people are sharing life together, right? I mean, say, look at the 32 people in these groups. Is it better that they're connected in something like this, or is it better that they're just kind of out doing life on their own? Okay, now, what's the drawbacks? What's the problems we have now, though? Yeah, it's hard to fit in the house or dorm room or whatever, right? Those kind of things, okay? So we've added, which is good, but what's better than adding? Okay, and how do you multiply? In a sense, you do, but it's really not dividing, it's really birthing, which is the point of small groups. Now, are you ready to do that? Well, now, now, why are you ready, Jonathan? Well, now, that's not en- uh, that, that, Well, but that's not enough. Okay, you, you have another leader. Okay, so now, here's what you're going to do. We're, gonna, we're getting ready to multiply. So we're going to multiply, like Beth said, by dividing and birthing. So what, what do you think we're going to do? Okay, so you've got two leaders in each group. So you're going to divide the 16 into 8 with the leader in each group, right? And then the the groups are going to move, the other groups are going to move to each of these corners, okay? So you all get that done now as quickly as you can. Okay, so, so, how many small groups do we have now? Okay, how many people do we start with? How many people do we have now? 32. So we've doubled. So, so is this good? Okay, now think about it for a minute. What if we double again? How many are we going to have then? Okay, at that point we'd have eight groups. Okay, what if we double again? How many people are we going to have? Okay, what if we double again? Okay, what if we double again? Wow, John, you're making the college students look bad, I'm telling you. That's a, you're just showing off now, aren't you? <laughs> okay, so, okay, we, we've got four groups, but everybody's still connected together in a small group, Right? So we're growing larger, and we're growing smaller at the same time. So this is, is this a good thing? We're, we're, we're reaching people, we're adding people, people in community, people in fellowship. We're developing leaders, okay? But we still got one problem. What, what, what's the problem we got? Are we just going to leave these cute little faces out, out here just... 
and ju just ignore them. Okay, that that would be dangerous for the rest of the world, though. But um, so so what can what, so what's the two things that we need to do now? Okay, we go get them, but what else do we need to do? What's missing in each group? A a another leader. Okay, so the idea from here would be, okay, let's keep building our community, keep helping each other grow, but at the same time, let's reach out, let's develop a leader, and then at some point, you know, if we grow again to 16, we have a leader, we birth again, then we have eight small groups, and we have 64 people, so we quadruple at that point. And, and that's basically the strategy, the, the ministry strategy of what we're talking about with small groups. And uh, how many of you have you ever heard of, maybe listened to preach Pastor Andy Stanley? You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever heard him? He's one of the greatest communicators in the world. He, he, he's, an, he's an incredible uh, preacher, incredible communicator. But he would tell you, I mean, and, and, I mean, their church, they have like 30-some thousand, they maybe more than that now every week. But he, what he would say, the key is, if you really want to change the world, and he practices what he preaches, he's not like a lot of big-name preachers that they may, they may preach, they may talk about small groups, but he is in a small group, he's been in a, whole small, in a small group, his whole ministry that's doubled and multiplied. You want to change the world, it's birthing small groups. I mean, you look at where the church is exploding around the world, including in China, it's shell churches, house churches. It, 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 it's small groups because you know you're not limited by by space. Like you just develop a leader, move to another house. You know, in, in buildings, you know, Sunday school. There's nothing wrong with it. Sunday school done right, small group done right, done right are built on the same principles. But Sunday school is the most expensive way to do ministry in the world because if you're really going to multiply, you can't build enough buildings to create enough space to keep up with it. You're not limited by that though in in, in, in small groups. So you're growing larger, you're growing smaller. You're reaching people, you're building relationships, you're making disciples, you're loving people, you're helping them through the hard times of life. That's what we're talking about. We see we're in circles, we come together in rows to worship. Hopefully this kind of helps you get a visual and a feel for what we're talking about, okay? So thank you for playing along and make we kind of reassemble now and we'll kind of move through some more of this material. Okay, if you got a Bible, as we move into this next section that talks about our mission statement, uh, if you would, let's go to John chapter 17, and I want to show you what this is based on uh, scripturally. And, and, and here's what... Uh, and, and, and this may end up, the wording may be different at International Fellowship, but this, this is our wording at True Life as far as our small group mission statement. And, and even if, um, you know, you're not, a lot of you are never going to be part of True Life. Some of you are never going to be part of International Fellowship. Some of you are getting ready. How many of you are you getting ready to graduate? Congratulations. That, 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 that's awesome. And, and uh, you know, you're going to, you know, go wherever. And God's going to use you, but I mean, I hope you can take something out of, not, out of tonight and use it wherever God uh, sends you in the future. But th this is our mission statement, to meet people in small group settings, to build a community of fully devoted followers of Christ within, talk about within the church, in order to reach the community w without. Uh, that's our small group mission statement. And, and it's based on a section of scripture in John chapter 17, uh, if you want to go there. And John chapter 17 to me, it is one of the most amazing things I've ever read. Because it, it, it's Jesus talking to his Father shortly before he dies. And, and, and to me, if you want kind of an insight into the nature and the character of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is one of the uh, main places to find it. I don't know how many of you have ever watched someone die. 
as a pastor, I've had uh, just that bittersweet experience. In a way, it's a privilege. In, in a way, it's awful. But, you know, when someone is dying or about to die and, and, and they know that it's coming, they don't waste words. I mean, if they're lucid and really able to communicate, they're going, what's going to come out of them is what's really important to them. And, and really, that's what's happening here. As Jesus, knowing in just a few hours, he's going to have the wrath of God poured out upon him on the cross. And he's talking to his father. And, and really what we see is he prays here. He, he, he's, um, he, he really, his primary concern is the glory of God. I mean, that's where he begins in this chapter. And he, he, he's, he's, he's praying, he's talking about that. And then he's, he's praying for his followers then. But uh, towards the end of the chapter, starting in verse 20, really he's praying for us because he's praying for the people who are going to believe through the apostolic witness down through the centuries. And, and he says in John 17, starting in verse 20, he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And if you're a Christian, you're an answer to that prayer. Because... Really, what the New Testament is, in essence, is the apostolic witness to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to, to the person and work of Jesus Christ that was left for us after the apostles died for us to continue to have an eyewitness testimony and, and an infallible record of the Lord Jesus Christ to, so that we would have faith. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It says the gospel is the power of God and the salvation for everyone who believes. So the apostles communicated the gospel under the leading of the Holy Spirit, and, and we see Jesus through that. We trust Him, and so we're fulfillment of what He said here. And, and, but notice what He says. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. He said Jesus' prayer is that all of his followers be united together as one in him. And so when we're divided, when we're fighting against each other, when we're fighting with other denominations, when we have broken relationships with other believers, when we hold grudges and we don't forgive, we're sinning against Jesus who died to make us one. That's God's plan for the church. In, in the words of the famous U2 song from the early 1990s, we're one, but not the same. We're, we're different, but we're one in Christ, one body, many members. And you know, part of the way we live out that oneness, part of the emphasis on those one another commands that we have, is really small groups become a vehicle for us to obey those. That's part of the point of them. When there's, when there's unity in the body, or disunity in the body of Christ, it's kind of like this. Let me give you this example. Um, my son, some of you may know him, his name's Jay, he's a junior at Carson Newman. He's an RA buff. And uh, he, uh, we, I passed it in Maryland. We moved back here. We went to a public school, and it, it, last year's elementary school. And then we went to a Christian school for middle school, and then back in public school, we graduated from Morristown West. But uh, he, he was in um, a Christian school in middle school. It was a new school, just kind of getting started, kind of small. And they wanted to have a basketball team. So they started a basketball team. I don't know if any of you ever went to Christian school. If you've ever gone to a small Christian school and played sports, you're going to be kind of rough because, you know, it's small and there's not a big base to pull from. And, and so Jay was like the only boy that ever played basketball before. So they put together a basketball team. And that sounds like good because, you know, he's the only one to play before. He's going to be the best player on the team. But that's not all it's cut out to be, okay? Uh, because basketball is a team sport, and if you like playing one on five, it's not good, okay? So um, it went well sometimes. Sometimes it didn't go well. well. One game, he had the best game of his life. I mean, I don't know how many of you ever, how many of you played basketball. Uh, Rusty was a small college All-American basketball player. So and we grew up playing basketball together, and he got better than me at some point. It's kind of sad. But uh, um, you know the, those nights you have every once in a while where it's like, it, it look, you, know, you just can't miss. 
He had one of those nights. He scored 34 points, which is a lot of points in a probably 24, 28 minute middle school game. I mean, he was just, I mean, he was hitting three or five or six three pointers. It was just something that was just ridiculous. It was just kind of a once in a lifetime kind of thing. And you think, you know, his teammates would be happy and all this. Well, I guess they got jealous because the next game, before the game, while they were warming up, some of his teammates went up to him and said, we're going to steal the ball from you tonight. And is this unity in the body of Christ? It's kind of like stealing the ball from your own teammates. But because we are on the same team, and, and we're supposed to be working together, and each other aren't the enemy. Jesus prayed that we would be one. But I want you to notice this. He said, that may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Now, that's kind of mind-blowing if you still really stop and think about it. You see what he's saying? The model, the picture for our unity together is God's unity within himself. You heard somebody say this. You heard somebody say that God was lonely and that's why he created people. You heard somebody say that? It gets, pardon my bluntness, but when people say that, it's just dumb. Okay? Because if God were lacking anything, he wouldn't be God. Can I just tell you, God is gracious enough that he wants my praise and he wants me to talk to him. But it's not because he needs me, it's because I need him. You know, when I prayed, when I woke up this morning, you know, Jesus wasn't sitting on his throne in heaven. It's like, awesome, I'm complete now because Jimmy talked to me today. It did not just make his day. Okay? Uh, <laughs> I need him. He's gracious enough to want me. Because God, throughout all the ages of eternity, has been complete and perfect and in relationship and in fellowship within himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know the only time that was ever broken? is when the world went dark. When the Father turned away from the Son, when Jesus was absorbing all the wrath of God upon the cross. That's how much He loves us. That's what He went through for us. That's why He was shrinking away and praying, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before. And so, God is a relationship within Himself. And that's why those of us who are, all, which is all of us who are made in the image of God, are created for a relationship with Him, and then also relationships with each other. And it's why when we're not in a relationship with Him, and when we're not in good relationships with other people, life's empty. I mean, why do people do such stupid things to have such bad relationships sometimes? It's because there's this innate desire as image bearers of God to be in connection with other people. And we'll hurt ourselves to keep from being lonely. And you see, the purpose of the church then, what Jesus is saying and what he's praying for here, is that we be one in him and he's one in us. That through his work on the cross, that we're connected with him and then we're also connected with each other, literally and practically. But notice the ultimate purpose of this. Look at the end of verse 21. That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I and them and you and me that... They may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Notice what Jesus, his, his prayer here. Father, I desire. What did he want? Before he died, he wanted to bring us into his very presence to see the glory of God. But what he's saying here as far as how it's going to happen, it's going to happen when we're one in him so the world 
can see what real love and what real relationship looks like. And that's what the world should be getting from the church. Instead of us throwing stones at each other and everybody else, the idea is, is that through the cross of Christ, we're connected with God in a loving relationship with the God who is eternally in relationship with Himself. And then out of that, we're living in relationship and unity and love with each other. And I believe when we live that way as Christians, then the gospel becomes irresistible to people. But the problem is, we obscure the gospel instead of revealing the gospel with the way that we love God and love each other. And I think one of the greatest vehicles for expressing this love and unity is in small groups where people get together and they do life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, together. And so, you know, this is their strategy. And I'm just going to hit these quickly. Hopefully you kind of saw it out of the, the little exercise we did a minute ago. What we're talking about is identifying, training, developing, and deploying leaders. The, the key to small group multiplication, small group health, is leadership. We train our leaders at two life. They, 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 they apprentice. Okay, then we're talking about forming small groups of people who meet together regularly for life application Bible study, to build authentic relationships, to care for one another, for prayer, for service, and ministry to others, and to reach out to those around them. Rusty, can I elaborate on what that looks like practically? You're kind of going to hit on what a group meeting looks like or what a, what a group does. Well, okay, kind of what goes on in a small group meeting, you may fill in in gaps I leave, is normally groups have a meal, there's a Bible study, there's a prayer time, there's just, you know, some groups do a fun activity, you know, there's kind of some sharing there, and then a lot of what happens is there's connections that are made outside the group, where people are building friendships, they're doing things together, they're there for each other, somebody's going through a hard time, they call somebody in the group, and they minister to each other out of that relationship. So we believe the first line of pastoral care in a church is a small group. Um, not saying that we don't do that as elders, but in a lot of cases, the people in the group are going to be better equipped to do that out of the relationship. I mean, think about it. Um, you know, we have, I mean, if everybody showed up at the same time at True Life, we probably have 400 some people. I don't know exactly. We had 422 on Easter Sunday, I mean, which is like a real high number for us. So, you know, if you have four elders or me as a full-time pastor, 422 people, that's not a real good ratio. But if you have a small group of 8 to 20 people that are relating to each other with a small group leader, you can meet needs, right? Um, most of, like, if there's a baby shower, bridal shower, somebody has a death in the family, sickness in the family, they need food or some kind of practical assistance, that happens through small groups. We've seen people give, each other, give people money, give people cars, give people places to live in small groups. And if you read the book of the Acts, that's the Bible being lived out. That's the church being the church. That's what we're talking about. A lot of the outreach uh, that we do as a church, we, we do through the small groups. A couple times a year, we do something called Arms Across Jefferson County. We do service projects in the community. We do that through small groups. We encourage our groups to be doing that on their own. People to be inviting people. People to be sharing the gospel. That's what we're talking about in a small group. We're talking about intentionally shepherding people towards full devotion to Christ. We're talking about striving to bring those who don't know Christ into a relationship with Him, with him in a Christian community. We're talking about developing uh, new leaders and, and, and birthing new groups. And, and for example... Uh, our small group, two or three years ago, birthed a small group of Christians for about five years. But he's been discipled. He's been trained. God has used him in this small group. And now in just a few weeks, like we kind of you know, gave an example in here, their group is birthing a new group. The Jeff Brigman is going to be the leader, and there's an assistant with each of those. And so that's going to multiply, and new people can be added. That's what we're talking about. That's how this grows. That's how this spreads. So that's our mission. That's our strategy. And so let's come to the next step. Uh, the next step 
question is, is I guess, getting into like what's the function or how should a small group function? What are things that are supposed to be happening in those small groups? Um, and then after that, we're going to talk about the benefits that we can see that come out of small groups. But um, in, in the functions of a small group, these are things that we have asked all of our small groups in our church to make sure that we are intentionally doing. Okay, so it, it, this is not something that we're just like, you know, I, I hope this all this works out. You know, this we, we're hoping for the best. We've got all these things over here that we want you to do, but we really ask our leaders to think this way. To think about these are things that we've thought about, we've prayed about, we believe that each group needs to be doing so that they can be effective and hopefully reach more people. And so the, um, the first one is, just kind of reiterates what we've already said, they're to be built on authentic relationships. Um, and that starts with the leader. So if you are to be, be a leader of a small group, or just think about in your sphere of friends that you may have, you may have a few friends that you're really close to, uh, the point of that is, is that somebody has to step up sometime, you know, along the way and, and take that relationship to a little bit deeper level. Who's going to be the first one to let down your guard? Who's going to be the first one to say, you know what, I need prayer. Here's what's going on. I'm, I, I'm hurting. I need prayer. I need help. You know, if we always have our defenses up and always put on this facade or this face, this happy face, you're really not being yourself. So somebody's got to step up and do that. And we ask our leaders to be the first to do that. Be authentic. So if you're leading a group of people, we want you to, to be real. And um, this is kind of funny. Pastor Phillips in our small group, in my small group. Um, and I, I'm pretty real, aren't I, Phil? Right. I, you know, I, I, I don't try to act don't behave well, I suppose, but Pastor Philip has this saying that he likes to, to say around me, and I hope you, you never hear this from Pastor Philip, but he says, you ain't right. And here in America, those aren't encouraging words, by the way. But I think the point is, is that I can be I can be who I am, or I can be myself around Philip, because I know he loves me. I don't have to put on a happy face around if I'm not really upset about stuff, so I guess that's, that part's easy, but I, I feel free to be real around him because I know that he loves me. And if you as a leader can let your people in your group know that you love them regardless, they're going to let down their guards and they're going to be real. So, be authentic. Secondly, small groups are places where truth meets life through application-oriented Bible study and discussion. This separates what the typical church meeting looks like. Now, it is, as a matter of fact, occasionally Jimmy, if he's preaching, he, he might ask a question. He gets kind of ugly sometimes, to be honest with you, okay? If he asks a question, he's probably looking for a certain answer. You know, sometimes he don't get the answer that he was looking for, and it, it's a little awkward. You know, everybody's like, oh, that's not what I was thinking. But um, it's, this is not the right setting for that. But a small group is. So you, you create your, your Bible study in a way that you can discuss things and have other people communicating back and forth. You can talk about it. And quite frankly, that's probably the best way that we can learn is actually hey, I've got a thought. What about this? And we, we encourage that in our small groups. So if we have small group people, leaders who insist on you know, just being a one-way conversation, they're probably not going to be very effective. And it's not going to be really what we're looking for. So we ask that that it's discussion-based, but also that it's you know application-oriented Bible study. We want it to apply to your life. So take Scripture... Take a topic, whatever it is that your your group is studying, and, and make it real. You know, help people see how it applies to your life today, or maybe down the road somehow. Number three, 
Small groups are places where people love each other and minister to one another's needs. We've talked about this already. Jimmy talked about it just a minute ago. We have lots of needs as people and in our church. And we ask our small groups to minister to one another. Love each other in your small group. Quite frankly, Jimmy doesn't have time. Philip doesn't have time. Uh, our administrative assistants do not have time to answer all the calls and to do all the ministry work that's needed. We have to do that in a small group setting. So we ask our groups to intentionally love each other and minister to each other. Number four, small groups are places where spiritual growth takes place through intentional shepherding, care and discipleship. When, when I'm training small group leaders, I, I'm basically saying, listen, this is like you are pastoring this little church. Think of yourself as a pastor. You are to be that first line of defense. You are to be that person that develops that relationship so that if there's something going on in your, in your group with one of your people, I want you to be the first person they think of that they can call. Now, does that mean that they never want to come and, and speak to the elders or, or someone else? No, that's not what we're saying. But we are hopefully welcoming ourselves as group leaders to the people so that they can come to you first. And perhaps we can minister and meet their needs. And that's really what God wants, you know, is, is uh, teaching pastors, you know, he's to equip the saints. And saints are to, to minister to one another. All right, number five. Small groups are places where people will be introduced to Jesus Christ. Again, this goes back to the essential, the foundation of why we're doing what we're doing so that we have opportunities to share Jesus with people. Uh, we have seen people come to Christ through our small group ministry. And that's what we want to continue to do. Um, number six. Small groups are places of prayer and service. There have been many times that a small group meeting consists of nothing but prayer because there's something so uh, intense or serious going on in someone's life that just need to say, you know what, we're not, we may not have Bible study tonight, but we're going to pray. We're going to spend time on our knees, you know, lifting these people up and serving one another and doing service work out in the community in order to share God's love with people. Uh, number seven, small groups are places where leaders are developed. Again, this maybe we identify spiritual gifts that people have. Maybe people need to be you know, in leadership. Number eight, small groups are a key part of the ministry of True Life Church, which we've said that over and over again. The ultimate goal is the multiplication of disciples, leaders, groups, and churches so that God's kingdom will be built to the glory of God. Now, why do we do small groups? There's lots of benefits to it. I want to share a, a kind of a personal testimony of a, a gentleman that came to Christ. Um, somewhat through our small group ministry. Uh, his name is Charlie Gibson. Some of you may know Charlie. Some of you don't. I know. But, um, as, as believers, as individual believers outside of church, outside of small groups, um, you never know when God's going to put somebody in your life that He wants you to speak truth to or to love or to minister to. And God gave me the opportunity to meet Charlie Gibson. Um, I'm in banking. I'm a banker. As, as, that's what I do for a living. And I met Charlie one day in Gibson City at, at my new job. I just got a brand new job. Um, and so I'm meeting all the new staff. I come in. They introduce me. There's this big board table. We're sitting around this table, all these people. Everyone there is very respectful and very kind, and you know, it's like, oh wow, you know. What, usually, we have to be that way to our boss, right? You, know, you have to show them respect, or it's like a bad night, I guess. But anyway, I'll never forget Charlie. Charlie comes in. He's got his bag of Burger King. It's breakfast time for him, and so while the guys introducing me and we're talking, everybody's just real, you know, quiet listening and. Respectful, and Charlie's sitting there just eating his biscuit and just, you know, carrying his being himself. And he, he, he's not impressed. 
I'll put it that way. He's just doing what he's going to do. I, I'm having my biscuit. I don't care who this guy is up here. I'm having my morning breakfast. And so, from there, Charlie's a very outgoing personality. He's very um, outspoken. He's got lots of energy, more than most of us in this room, I'm sure. But, anyway, I got to know Charlie a little bit, and uh, Charlie was not... Not a Christian, and he was not living for the Lord. And quite frankly, uh, he, he had a, a what we call a potty mouth. Uh, he, he liked to use bad language. He was irreverent. Okay. Um, so for whatever reason, God put a burden on my heart for Charlie. Because he's thinking, wow, what if this guy if he could channel all of this? energy and this enthusiasm and people like Charlie. He's a real people person. Everybody likes Charlie, but I was thinking, what if you could channel all this stuff for the glory of God? What kind of an impact could he have on people around him? Because people like him and he's contagious, but he's not living at all for the Lord. So, you know, I, I was thinking about true life's mission statement. Meet people where they are and help them become fully devoted followers of Christ. So I was like, okay, I've got to meet Charlie where he is. I've got to connect with him some way. I, I can't just say, Charlie, you've got to be a church guy, okay? You've got to start living for the Lord. You've got to stop doing this and that or whatever. I had to meet him where he was. And we connected in a way. Uh, Jim mentioned play basketball, and Charlie's a sports guy. So uh, we started going down to the community center before work and playing basketball. And um, so we would play, and, and he's a very good athlete. We just play hard. And, you know, one morning um, I decided, okay, I'm going to take this up another level. And when Charlie and I would play ball, um, I told you that he was potty mouth. If he missed a shot or if something bad didn't, or if something bad happened, he was cussing. So the whole time, I mean, it was bad. But anyway, uh, one game, I said, okay, we're, we're playing one-on-one -on -one at this point. I said, if I beat you this game, here's the deal. You have to, you, you can't use bad language anymore, at least today while we're playing ball. And that was my challenge to me. He's like, okay, it's on. Let's go. And so we played, and we played hard, and it was physical, and I beat him. So Charlie, had, he had to keep his word, and we continued to play that day, and somehow he didn't use any more bad language that day, okay? Fast forward, I, I started talking to Charlie about spiritual things. I started asking him about church. I started asking him about his relationship with, with God. Did he even believe God, believe in God? And eventually, you know, Charlie's like, I, I'm not into the church thing. I've seen too much bad stuff in church. And I asked him, I said, sir, why don't you come to our small group? We're going to have a small group. It's my house. You don't have to go to church. You and your wife come to a small group. So he ended up coming to a small group before he came to church just to check it out. Because he felt like, that's I can handle that. I don't want to go into the church, but I can handle that. So um, I'm gonna, we're going to show you just a short clip of his testimony. And I just want you to kind of get to know Charlie a little bit. Um, I had a really good upbringing in Jefferson City with a good Christian family. My mom and dad were both Christians. Uh, dad was a teacher. Mom was a teacher. Both taught for 30 years. Um, was baptized at the age of nine in First Baptist Church in Jefferson City. Uh, Wade Darby was the pastor. He's, he's long gone now. But uh, when I got in my teen years, I started the rebellious stages that most children seem to go through. And... Uh, and of course, there was, I had four brothers, so there's five boys, and we're going all in different places. But I, I rebelled and wanted to be, wanted to do everything myself. Didn't want any help, didn't want any advice, didn't want to hear from anybody, and that's what I did basically my whole life. And that was drink, party, and cuss, and smoke. And I had just one big holiday from the time I was a kid till I was almost 45 years old. Uh, the Lord spared me many times when I shouldn't even be living anymore. But, uh, uh, a friend of mine, Rusty Arwood, who at that time was a co-worker uh, 
invited me to his house for small group one night. Of course, I kind of made fun of it because I thought it was the Sunday school and I'm going to get these goody two shoes people to their house that don't cuss, drink, smoke, or raise cane. And, uh, and I just wasn't used to that. And I'll have to say it was one of the most refreshing things to be around people who didn't have the worldly influence on them that I had been used to living around. Um, we, I and my wife, oh, Sharon and myself, continued to come uh, and go to a small group with them. Then I was invited to the True Life Church and came to church and joined the softball team. And uh, we're playing softball. And I was on my way home uh, after a game, actually. And uh, it just hit me on the way home that I was actually not bulletproof anymore, that I was going to die. And all I had in front of me was absolutely darkness. And I physically saw this darkness. Got on the phone, called Rusty, and said, "Hey, man, I've got to do something, and I've got to do something now. It's time. I have no, I have nothing." And I turned around, drove back to his house, and say, "That day um, was beautiful to get that weight off my shoulders of all that stuff I tried to stuff in that hole that everybody tries to fill in their heart. And now I knew what I'd been missing all my life, and uh, I was rebaptized here at Tree Life Church. It was a wonderful, wonderful day." I'm teaching Kids Rock uh, Sunday School at the church on Sunday mornings, and anybody that knows me or knew me from my past would say, there is no way in the world that Charles Gibson is teaching Sunday School at any church anywhere because they know me. And that's a true statement. Uh, but uh, I want you to know that from my heart, that, is, that my life has changed and has changed for the better. So there's a real-life person. That's, that's a real person that was headed to hell. And, you know, God just spoke his heart, reached out to him. And the, good, the, the cool thing about it is, is that, you know, he started in our small group before he came to church. And he told you why. Um, but that just kind of reaffirmed to me that, you know, if we can present a platform or a way to reach people that maybe we can't, here at the church, then I'm all for it. I think we should all be willing to say, God, however we can reach the lost, let's do it. Let's let's try it and see if it works. So, you know, he's, he's still teaching. He's teaching men's Bible study on Wednesday nights, too. Um, and I can tell you that he, he is sharing God's love with the community. He's sharing his faith now. And there's no telling, you know, how many seeds he's planted, but there's no telling what God's going to do with all of that. You know, my guess is God's going to bless it now. Um, but there's many other benefits. That's just one reason. Uh, Charlie's life, people. The other benefits is that you, you will hopefully understand the Bible in a better way because you do have the opportunity to study it in a different way than you can here at church. Um, you'll begin to really feel like part of God's family. You'll feel welcome. You'll be connected with people. You can live those real life relationships with people. Uh, prayer will become more meaningful to you when people are praying for you regularly and you're able to share things that you need prayer for and you're able to pray for other people. It becomes more real. Uh, you will be able to handle stress better because others will be helping you bear your burdens. We all get stressed out sometimes. And as Christians, the Bible teaches us to, you know, bear one another's burdens and help each other. Uh, you will have a natural way to share Christ with friends, relatives, and work associates, just like Charlie. You will discover leadership skills you never knew you had. Uh, what we try to do in our small groups is we try to identify uh, strengths in each of the people that are in our group, and we ask them to take on some ownership. We ask some people to do this or some people to do that, whatever it may be. But hopefully we identify some ways that they can plug in and they can begin leading and doing some things that they've never done before. You will deepen your understanding of worship. Some of you might think, well, I thought worship was just when there's singers up here and we're singing and we raise our hands. Some people raise their hands. I thought that's what worship was. But it's not confined to that at all. You can worship wherever you are. You can worship in different ways. Our posture can be different when we worship. It's all about our heart. And when we learn that, when we learn that in different settings, then we'll learn that God 
you know, he can be worshipped anywhere, anytime. Uh, the last thing you'll be functioning like a New Testament church. And obviously God blessed the New Testament church. It just blew up. And, and we're asking God to do that, you know, today in our church. we got a couple more things and then we'll be finished. Get this next thing really, really quick because I think we touched a lot. I just want a little addendum to the story about Charlie's. This was a few years ago when we were in a different building. I literally had a lady just stop by one time, never been to a church or anything like that, and asked me if it was true that Charlie Gibson had become a Christian. And so, I mean, that's really how a, a changed life really can uh, affect a, a, a community. Um, it's the key elements of small group strategy. And like I said, I think we. Uh, touch on, on, on hit these, maybe see them all together here. I'm just going to minute or two on these, but a reasonable span of care is the idea that one person shouldn't be caring for too many people. But, you know, if you're looking after half a dozen, dozen people, that kind of thing, that's reasonable and manageable as opposed to trying to minister uh, to hundreds of people. Um, the leadership development, your group, as spoke by Bill Donahue in the small group ministry to your church, Rides on the ability to identify and develop qualified leaders to separate little flocks of believers and reach out to strays in need Christ. So, if you're going to be a small group leader, one of your most important tasks is to identify and develop other leaders within your group and to shepherd them and raise them up. Because that's what it's going to take for, uh, for number three, multiplication to happen. Um, you know, it's the idea of the open chair. That, and at times in our small group, we've literally done this. Just have an open chair as a reminder that somebody needs to be in that chair. Somebody needs Jesus. Somebody needs to be connected to other believers. Then, you know, you add people. And then, uh, as you develop leaders, like we talked about, uh, you, you multiply them. Uh, we talked about intentional shepherding. And Rusty uh, said it very well in a succinct way that what we're asking small group leaders to do is basically pastor that little flock in a sense. Now, you know, small group leaders, you know, hopefully, Church, but still, they're the, the primary first line for uh, that group, and the pastor and the shepherding is really synonymous. Uh, it's in the it, you know, 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. In Spanish, it says, uh, Jehovah is my pastor. The, the word for shepherd is pastor in Spanish. In Greek, it's the same thing. Um, if you look at the bottom of the page, it says biblical principles for shepherding, and it goes over into the next page. I'm not going to take the time right now to walk through those, but would encourage you, if you're going to be a part of small groups and potentially a small group leader at International Fellowship, that you read through those, that you study uh, these verses, and that you be familiar with them and try to apply them in your small group ministry. And then uh, the last one, ministry coordination that all the small groups and all the ministries in the church must function together to accomplish the mission of the church. And, and that is, you know, sometimes in church, I think what happens, you've got little sub-ministries all over the place kind of doing their own thing, when, when really the goal is to have one unified mission that all of the ministries are working together to accomplish. But if your philosophy of ministry is that you're going to be a church of small groups, kind of take that a step further when, when, when we're really you're trying to do much of the ministry of the church through the small groups. But, but everything has to fit together. And, you know, if you do one thing, you can't do another thing. And that's why we've strategically chosen not have a lot of services, not have a lot of meetings, not have a lot of programs to put our eggs in a small group basket of people developing Relationships, And I don't think you can do both well. I don't think you can be a program church and a small group church. I think you have to decide uh, one or the other, or they end up competing against one another. And we don't want ministries competing. We want everything to be coordinated together. So, give back to Rusty for the last section. Yeah, I'm just going to end um, just on just some real practical things. Uh, of course, I feel like you guys will have to develop as far as you know, identify. Practically, what we do here is we've got a couple of books that we give to all of our group leaders. The first one is this book called Leading Life Changing Small Groups. And this is a very, it's just a very practical, helpful book, okay? 
book that we use is this book called Eight Habits of Effective Small Group Leaders. Um, this one is something that I'm, I'm going to just read what those eight habits are, and that's what we'll close on. But we want all of our leaders to be thinking this way also. Number one, dream of leading a healthy, growing, multiplying group. Those three elements, healthy, growing, and multiplying group. Uh, don't just get satisfied. Don't just be like, okay, I'm going to have this little group. I hope somebody comes and that's the end of it. We want our leaders to have a vision. We want them to think forward and think about what it's going to look like when eventually they are able to birth another group. And do this over and over again. Number two, pray for your group members daily. We believe that's very important. It's as part of pastoring. You've got to pray for your people because they have needs. They need your prayer. Number three, invite new people to visit the group weekly. Uh, it, when your group gets to a certain size, this gets a little more difficult to want to continue to invite people. That's why birthing is so important. Number four, contact group members regularly. Why do you think this is important? It's kind of sticky. Kind of keeps you in touch with them. Kind of helps you make sure that you know what's going on in their lives. You know, stay connected. Number five, prepare for the group meeting. Wow, that's pretty basic, isn't it? Prepare. You know, one of the things I think is just at least have a, a decent lesson prepared every time that you meet. Do, you know, let's get real basic here. I mean, I know that sounds silly, but. That's something that we all need to be doing is preparing for meeting. Number six, mentor and apprentice leader. You will need them, hopefully sooner rather than later. You know, when you first start, you're probably thinking, if we can just get a group, it will be a big deal. But go ahead and think forward. Think about not only do we have need to identify a group leader, but we also need to have apprentice leaders that can take the next step that we can grow into. Um, number seven, plan group fellowship activities. Fellowship. Make it fun. Don't just make it, you know, so typical that it gets boring. Mix it up a little bit. And the last thing says, be committed to personal growth. As Christians and as leaders, we have to make sure that we are keeping our spiritual hearts in check. That we are doing what we need to do personally to be in the right relationship with Christ so that we can have a right relationship with other people. So, I hope that some of the information you've heard is useful, that it's helpful. As you can tell, we are serious about small groups here at True Life. We believe that God has blessed our small group ministry here. Uh, it's not perfect. We've got a lot of room for improvement. We need more leaders. But one thing that we have seen is that when people are connected to a small group, they stay. They stay in church. They stay involved. The people that are involved regularly in our small group ministry are the ones that are ministering, that are serving each weekend, and the ones that never get connected to small groups typically are the ones that are not here regularly, and that sometimes you're never seen it again. It's pretty typical in this place. But when you don't develop those relationships that we've been talking about, when you, when you don't have that true common life together, that fellowship with other believers, that people just kind of go by the wayside. And as a church, it's hard to stay connected to everybody. There was, here's, here's an example. We had a small group this afternoon, right after a second service. There was a, a young man there that said, I've been at True Life for about a year. I had never seen a boy. I went out. This is not a huge church. But he said he's been here for about a year. My wife and I both said, I thought he was visiting with somebody today. He's connected to somebody I'm not sure who, but he's connected because he's continued to come. I think it's with maybe the, the Phil Holmes or the Holtz. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. But the point is this. And it's sad. And I'm not proud of this. I'm one of the elders here. I don't even know half the people in this church because I don't get around to see everybody on a typical Sunday. And they're not all in my small group, so I don't have relationships with each one of them. 
but we need, and that's why we rely on other people in the church to be ministering to them, to be loving on them, to be connected to them, and hopefully, you know, the International Fellowship Church will do the same. We all will all think about what is your role and your responsibility. I just want to say that we're excited about what God's doing in the International Fellowship. Thankful to be a part of it. Thankful that you're a part of it. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, be able to talk to you tonight about something that we're very passionate about. And appreciate you hanging in with us for about an hour and a half. I know that's a long time. But I hope it's been helpful to you. Like I said, even if you're, you're never back here again, I hope you can take some of this and use it wherever God has you in, in the future. And for those of you that are graduating, I'm a Carson graduate, so congratulations. God bless you and all the best uh, to you in the future. And uh, we'll turn it back over to Pastor Philip now. Has this been a help to you tonight? You want to thank them? Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Rusty. Appreciate you guys coming and sharing your hearts and sharing your experiences, uh, what God has done through your life and your own lives sharing that with us tonight. We definitely will be an uh, international fellowship, a church of small groups. Uh, we see that. We sense the leadership of the Lord in that and see that that's going to be a vital strategy in, in what we're doing and, and how we're functioning as a church. Um, let me just say a couple of announcements. Uh, Next Sunday night is Mother's. I mean, that's Mother's Day. We will not be meeting the, the Sunday night after that. Uh, our family is going to another graduation where our daughter uh, is graduating from Union University. So the next couple of Sunday nights, we, we do not plan to meet as International Fellowship. We're going to take some time in the next few weeks. And, and like I said, we, we, can, we completed our series uh, basically last Sunday night of the biblical foundations of the church and talked about, had, had a great time talking about, you know, those biblical foundations, the authority of God's Word, uh, the glory of God, the great commission, the great commandments, the, glory, uh, the, the power of the gospel, and so forth. And the Lord has blessed that. We believe that God is going to bring those things to fruition through our small groups and through our worship time together. We, we want to be, and we have that vision of being a multi-ethnic church, making disciples who continue to make disciples, both here and wherever God sends us around the world. Amen? So, uh, just want to encourage you, and, and if um, some of you have already filled out a, reform, a form, a response form, saying, I want to be a small group leader, I believe God wants me to be a small group leader, or a small group host or hostess, uh, or serve in other ways. Uh, those those forms were around uh, for several weeks. And uh, but if you are interested in being a part of International Fellowship, if you're interested, particularly in being a small group leader or host hostess, uh, and you've not already let us know through those forms, would you please let us know tonight or in the days ahead? And you know, we're going to be taking these principles uh, that that Jimmy and Rusty have, have shared with us tonight and in the coming days, coming weeks, begin to develop that. And uh, as he mentioned tonight, as we've said already, uh, because Sunday night seems to be the best time for us to gather together uh, and to do what we're doing, uh, we, we, we feel like it's strategic to worship once a month and that is falling out to be the first Sunday night of the month. It seems that that's how it's falling. I think that's good. 
Everybody like that? Say amen. And then uh, the other nights will be having the other Sunday nights between those times we'll be having our small groups. Some some people have already expressed uh, an interest in, in jumping in to true life small groups, and, and that's not bad. That's good. Uh, the Lord will lead us and guide us as we work through it all. Amen. But we're we're hoping and praying and, and have the vision of having at least three small groups in international fellowship by the end of this year. So you can pray with us that God will put all that together, and as we take these principles and flesh them out in the days ahead, in the weeks coming, that, that we'll begin to see uh, uh, that come into fruition. Amen? Let's keep praying. Let's keep asking questions. Let's continue trusting, trusting the Lord to guide us in every step of the way. Amen? Let's stand together. We're going to be dismissed. Are there any other questions uh, from of Jimmy and Rusty tonight before we go. Alright. I'm so glad you're here tonight, every single one of you. We do join in what Jimmy has said and, and congratulating those of you who are graduating seniors and uh, whatever God leads you to do in the days ahead, we pray that He will bless you richly and use your work in and through your lives to His honor and glory. I ask uh, Jonathan Keith, would you close us in prayer? Sure. God, thank you so much uh, for tonight, uh, for the celebration, for the, the work that God has done in Jason's life. And God, I thank you so much that we can come together and uh, worship you, God. And I uh, pray for the beginning stages of this church, God. I pray that you will establish it. And Lord, I pray that this will be a place that uh, people who don't know you can come in, Lord, and uh, can meet you and have a relationship with you. God, I thank you for what you're doing here. And I pray that you will continue to do a powerful work within this church. It's all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.